Good afternoon, everyone. Um, women's health. So allow me to say a couple of words about women's health. Why women's health? Um, I've been involved with reproductive health for most of my career. I think we need to realize that women's health is not simply reproductive health. It's an example of population health, where health is defined by the World Health Organization as not merely the absence of disease or infirmity, but a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. The slogan, Healthy Women, Healthy World, embodies the fact that women play a critical role in maintaining the health of their families and their community. Therefore, it's important that women know of and have access to important preventative healthcare services that will ensure early detection of medical problems and in doing so maintain good health. So we believe that this METALKS will provide information and education that will help women achieve this goal. So this brings me to Dr. Paula Gordon, who is our first speaker of the day. Now, if ever there was an individual that promoted and practiced these principles defined by women's health, it is Dr. Paula Gordon. Um, since early in her career, her mission was to advance the knowledge of breast health and screening options, especially dense breasts, and to enhance early diagnosis and less aggressive management of breast cancer. She not only did extensive research to achieve this and published numerous articles, but she's also a tireless teacher, not only of medical learners, but also of the general public. So we really um, appreciate the fact that she would come here and talk to us today about this important topic of women's breath health. Just to finish off, she has received numerous awards for all this work that she's done. I'll mention two specific there. Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Medal, and she was invested into the Order of British Columbia. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Paula Gordon. I'm so thrilled to be here. Thank you for inviting me, because it is very important to me that as many as possible in the public are educated about breast health and breast density. So I want to start with a show of hands. How many of the women here know what your blood pressure is? Put your hand up and hold it up. Leave it up. Okay, now leave your hands up and keep your hand up if you know your breast density category. Uh-huh, I'm glad I'm here. Relax, breast density is an important piece of health information, like your height, your weight, your blood pressure, and even your cholesterol level. So here are my disclosures. I'm here on a volunteer basis, as you've heard, and I don't receive payment from industry or anyone else to give lectures on breast cancer. I am a radiologist, though, and so to mitigate any appearance of bias, all the information that I present to you will be from the peer-reviewed medical journals. In my two lectures today, I'll explain the benefits of early detection of breast cancer, and the optimal strategy for doing that in as many women as possible. I'll describe how guidelines that affect millions of Canadian women were made with a flawed process. I'll describe what supplemental screening tests are currently in use for women with dense breasts and some that are just in development. So why do we screen? We screen to find as many cancers as early as possible and that matters for two reasons. First of all, to save lives, but as importantly, for the quality of life for women who are being treated for breast cancer with less harsh therapy. And there are three criteria that define which diseases it's reasonable to do population screening for. First, the disease has to be common enough to justify screening the population who will have the test. Next, the test has to be reasonably accurate. And finally, there has to be effective treatment for the stage at which the test finds it. And breast cancer satisfies these criteria. 
This chart is from the Canadian Cancer Society, and it underscores the importance of early detection. It shows how five-year survival drops as the stage of diagnosis goes up. So when a woman is diagnosed with breast cancer at stage zero or one, 99 to 100% of them are alive at five years. But if a woman's diagnosed at stage four, her five-year survival drops to 22%. In addition to reducing death, the other significant benefits of early detection of breast cancer with mammography are the ability to have, instead of a mastectomy, which is usually necessary when cancers are found larger, women can have a lumpectomy when cancers are found earlier. This is what lymphedema looks like. It's a common side effect of traditional armpit surgery done as part of breast cancer lymph node staging. It's permanent, and as you can imagine, it's life-changing. It's the most frequent complication that influences patients' quality of life, and it's the worst part of breast cancer for many women. But the risk of lymphedema with the traditional armpit surgery is 33%. But when we find cancer early, women can have a less invasive test called a sentinel node biopsy, which has a much lower risk of lymphedema, as low as 5%. So this is another reason we want to find cancers as early as possible. Women deserve the opportunity to avoid this complication. Going through chemo is challenging, and some women have long-term complications. But now, many women can avoid chemo altogether if their cancer is small and there are no positive nodes, and this is another reason to find cancers early. So the conversation about density starts with mammograms because density can only be determined on a mammogram. And I want to spend a few minutes teaching you about the value of mammography. So here's what we know. Annual screening starting at age 40 saves the most lives. And women are 40 to 60% less likely to die of breast cancer if they have mammograms than women who don't. And yet most provinces don't start offering screening until age 50. And that's because screening guidelines in Canada are made by a panel called the Canadian Task Force on Preventive Health Care. They're a group of volunteers with no expertise in breast cancer screening or treatment. And they use a much lower statistic. They say that mammograms reduce deaths by only 15 to 20 percent. Now, luckily, BC is one of four provinces that do allow women to self-refer starting at age 40. Unlike the other three provinces, BC doesn't allow those women to all attend annually unless they have a first-degree uh, family history. Now, this is a study from Canada, and it's the largest published study of modern mammography in the whole medical literature. They got data on almost 2.8 million women attending screening programs in Canada and compared them to women who didn't have screening mammograms. And they showed that women who attend screening are overall 40% less likely to die of breast cancer than women who don't. And for women in their 40s, they're 44% less likely to die. And there are many other high-quality, non-randomized studies that our task force ignored. So if you want to reduce your chances of dying of breast cancer, it makes sense to start having mammograms at 40. And as I said, we're lucky that in British Columbia, women can start at age 40. Now, in spite of the fact that BC's way ahead of the game that way, we do have a problem in, in British Columbia, and that's that women need a doctor's requisition. Sorry, not a requisition. Women need to give the name of their family doctor or a nurse practitioner to have a screening mammogram. And you all know that there are almost a million people in British Columbia that don't have a family doctor. So I'm hoping to change that. Also, because of misinformation and confusion from our task force, only about 25% of eligible women in their 40s are taking advantage of our screening mammography program. And I hope if there's anybody in the room here who's reluctant, I'm hoping I'll have you persuaded by the end of my talks. So here's some hot off the press research. My colleagues in Ottawa worked with Stats Canada to publish this paper a few weeks ago. They looked at the stages of cancer diagnosed and they compared the provinces who start screening at 40 with the provinces who don't start until age 50. And in provinces that screen in the 40s, more women are diagnosed with stage one cancer and fewer with stage two and three. And that applied not just to women in the 40s, but also to women up to age 60. So seeing so what this has shown is that screening in the 40s benefits women in the 40s and the 50s. It makes sense to screen women in the 40s. They're often caring for young children and aging parents. 
They're working and contributing to the economy. They are not expendable, and they deserve the opportunity for early detection. But as good as mammograms are, they're not perfect, and they don't find all cancers. And when a cancer is present and we don't find it on a screening mammogram, it grows. And it's usually diagnosed when it's big enough to be felt as a lump. Now, when a cancer is found at some point after a woman's last screening mammogram was negative, it's called an interval cancer because it was diagnosed in the interval between planned mammograms. Most of them are larger at diagnosis and they're more often lymph node positive than screen detected cancers and they have a poor prognosis. So an important goal of screening is to reduce interval cancers and we have to get better at finding cancers on screening tests so they don't become interval cancers. And that means that some women need extra tests, not instead of, but in, in addition to a mammogram. So with that long intro, I can now get into the part about breast density. Ideally, all average risk women should be offered annual screening mammograms starting at 40. But women who need more are those who are at higher risk than average, including women with dense breasts. Now the average lifetime risk, I'm sure many of you know the number, is one in eight or 12%. And you probably know that women who have a BRCA mutation are at a very high risk of breast cancer, or some, some as high as uh, 72%. Now, there's several online risk calculators. If you've had a mammogram in British Columbia since late 2018, your breast density will have been included on your mammogram report, and you can find out what it is. And then you can use the IBIS risk calculator which asks just a few questions, including your breast density. It's free, and it will tell you what your risk of getting breast cancer is. Um, you don't have to write down this um, link here. Just Google IBIS risk calculator, and you'll find it online. Now, dense tissue is the main reason that cancers can be missed on a mammogram. Radiologists are pretty good at recognizing cancer when it's visible. And here's a mammogram showing an obvious cancer in a 55-year-old woman. The picture on the left is when the breast is compressed from top to bottom. The middle picture is when the breast is uh, compressed at an angle, side to side. And this is a close-up of her cancer. And we know it's cancer because of its jaggedy edges. And you might not be able to know you can't see it in this lighting. There's some tiny little white dots there that are suspicious calcifications. And the reason we can see it so easily in her is because the cancer is white and the rest of her breast is dark gray, which is fat. But not all women's breasts are like this. So just try to remember for now what this cancer looked like for the next few slides. So this woman's breasts are almost entirely fat, and on a mammogram, fat is dark gray. There's virtually no breast tissue in her. The white lines you can see are blood vessels and what we call Cooper's ligaments. If she had that cancer from a couple of slides ago, we'd have no trouble seeing it in her fatty breasts. But these breasts are normal too, and they have a lot more white stuff, and that white stuff is normal breast tissue. And we call it dense because it blocks the passage of x-rays through the breast. If she had that cancer, there'd be an excellent chance that we'd find it in her mammogram. But these breasts are normal too. So unlike other organs in the body, like the chest and the kidneys and the, uh, the, the livers, which all look the same in anybody, breasts look really different between one woman and another. And when breasts get denser and there's more white tissue, it's harder to see cancers, which are also white. It's like, we say it's like trying to see a snowball in a snowstorm. It would be challenging or impossible to see cancer in her breasts because it can be masked by the normal tissue. And in her, there's a cancer hiding right there. And we don't see it. And some women's breasts have virtually no fat and they're all dense like these. Even a large cancer can be missed in this kind of breast tissue. And in fact, mammograms miss as many as 50% of cancers with women this dense. So this video shows the visibility of a cancer depends on the woman's breast density and where the cancer is located in her breast. We can see cancers in dense breasts if they overlie the fat. But for example, these are three screenshots from that video I just showed you of the woman who had category B density, which we call scattered densities. The picture on the left shows the breast without the cancer in it. The middle picture shows that we can see the cancer if it's over the fatty part of her breast. And even though she has hardly any dense tissue at all, the picture on the right, the cancer's here. And just unlucky for her that it happens to superimpose the very little breast tissue that she has.
it's still camouflaged in her and it would not be seen. So radiologists divide breast density into four categories, A through D. And look at, look at this, like the examples I just showed you, these are really different looking breasts, but they are all normal. Categories A and B are regarded as non-dense, C and D are regarded as dense. And 43% of women over the age of 40 have dense breasts. It's normal and it's common. But women need to know that the mammogram's ability to find cancer decreases as breast density increases. Now, in general, younger women have denser breasts and older women have less dense tissue, but not always. It's not uncommon to see a young woman with fatty breasts and an older woman with dense breasts. Cancer can be missed in any breast density, but it's far less likely to be missed in categories A and B. And as I told you before, breast density can only be determined by looking at a mammogram. You can't tell by feel. You can't tell by breast size or breast texture. Lumpy breasts are not necessarily dense. Both fatty and dense breasts can feel soft, firm, or lumpy. Some women's breasts feel like solid concrete, and they can be completely fatty on the mammogram. So you can't tell any other way. So the biggest risk of having dense breasts is the masking of cancers, because it, then we can't see them. But here's the double whammy. We have known since the 1970s that breast density is an independent risk factor for developing cancer. Women with the densest breasts in category D are four to six times more likely to get breast cancer than women with fatty breasts. It's, in fact, having dense breasts is a more prevalent risk factor than having a significant family history. Dense breasts are also at an increased risk of becoming interval cancers and also increase the likelihood of a false alarm after a screening mammogram. The denser the breast, the higher the risk of getting breast cancer. As I told you, dense breasts also increase the risk of an interval cancer. And as I mentioned before, interval cancers are bad. They're bigger and more often lymph node positive than screen detected cancers and they have a poorer prognosis. And we've known since the 1990s that women with the densest breasts are 18 times more likely to have an interval cancer. Now we can find many of those cancers when they're still small, before they become interval cancers, with extra tests, and we can prevent them from becoming interval cancers. So we talk a lot about equity in healthcare. This study from the Netherlands confirmed that women with dense tissue don't benefit equally from mammography as women with fatty breasts. Women with dense breasts had an estimated mortality reduction of only 13% compared to women with dense breasts sorry, compared to uh, women with non-dense breasts that have a 41% mortality reduction. So you can say that women with dense breasts are discriminated against if they only have access to mammograms for screening. And while it's normal to have dense breasts, women need to know if they do so they can understand the implications. There are about 3.4 million women over age 40 with dense breasts in Canada and over 800,000 who are in category D. So just to review why it's important for you to know whether you have dense breasts, women with dense breasts are at a higher risk of developing breast cancer than fatty breasts. Cancers diagnosed in women with dense breasts tend to be larger and more poor prognosis than in women with fatty breasts. And dense breasts have a much higher risk of an interval cancer discovered between screenings. For many, so what tests can we use to find the cancers missed on mammograms? Well, for many years it was it was shown that ultrasound could not find cancers that were not visible on mammograms and they were too small to feel. But that's before they invented high frequency probes. We published this paper over 25 years ago and it was followed by work from multiple other institutions and then multi-center trials that showed that high resolution ultrasound can find cancers that are too small to be feelable and they're still missed on mammograms largely because of dense breasts. Breast ultrasound can be done with a handheld probe. And there are special machines now with large probes that scan about a third of the breast called automated breast ultrasound, or ABIS for short. ABIS is available at some clinics in Ontario and Alberta, but not in BC anywhere at the moment. Any ordinary machine can do breast ultrasound, but not all clinics offer it. It's best done in a clinic that also does mammograms and needle biopsies, so if they see something abnormal, they can right away correlate it with a mammogram and do a needle biopsy rather than the patient having to shop around for a place that will do it. 
Now, in spite of all the emerging evidence on breast density, it was still not being shared with women, and in many cases with their doctors. Nancy Capella was a PhD in educational leadership in Connecticut. In 2004, only weeks after her own routine annual mammogram was negative, she found a lump in her breast, and, ha and after having an ultrasound which showed a cancer, she was diagnosed with stage 3C with 13 positive nodes. In her research, she found our paper and some other early studies of screening ultrasound, and she asked her doctors about it, but they all dismissed the notion of screening with ultrasound, so she went around them and she lobbied for legislation to require patient notification of breast density, its impact on mammographic sensitivity, and the potential for supplemental screening. Dr. Capello spearheaded the grassroots movement in the US, which as of today has 37 states and the District of Columbia with density inform legislation requiring women to be given at least some awareness of the issue and all in their mammogram results letter. And the FDA has mandated that all American women be told their breast density. As of now, insurance coverage for supplemental screening is available in 12 states. Advocates are also active in Europe and Australia through Dense Breast Info. Both France and Austria already offer screening ultrasound to all women with category and C density. Dense Breast Canada is a nonprofit education and advocacy group, and thanks to the tireless work of their volunteers, British Columbia was the first province in 2018 to inform all women of their density in the screening mammogram results letter. Since then, five other provinces do as well. Yukon will start this fall, and Saskatchewan will start in 2023. Quebec puts the information in the patient's online health portal. Ontario and Northwest Territories only tell women in category D that they're dense, which is misleading to all the women in category C because they think they're not dense, and they are, and they have all the risks. BC is currently the only province where it's specified that health insurance covers screening ultrasound, but it still requires a requisition. This paper from our clinic was published earlier this year. My colleagues looked at screening breast ultrasound done on women with category C and D density in the first year that it was covered by MSP. We found seven cancers per thousand uh, screens performed with a low biopsy rate and a high positivity rate. The cancers were small, invasive, and node negative. Some authorities would like to restrict screening ultrasound to women in only category D and or women with a family history, but note, 40% of the cancers that we found had no family history and 60% of them were in category C. So ideally, all women in category C and D should be able to access screening ultrasound. And of all the tests that I'm gonna talk about, ultrasound is the most widely available, the least expensive test to supplementary screen women with dense breasts. And when I say supplemental, I mean it's in addition to the mammogram, not instead of. Don't forget, you don't even know what density you are unless you have a mammogram. It requires no injection, it uses minimal pressure so it's comfortable. It uses no ionizing radiation and it's relatively inexpensive. It's the most comfortable way to guide a biopsy. It finds mostly small node negative cancers on average two to three per thousand, but remember I just showed you we're finding seven per thousand. And it's been shown to reduce interval cancers. The downsides are that some benign lumps can appear concerning on ultrasound and need to be biopsied because better safe than sorry. And quality can vary. Like any ultrasound, it's operator dependent and there is a learning curve. But certainly it's within the scope of any place that does diagnostic breast ultrasound. Now currently there's a shortage of ultrasound techs across Canada, so many clinics do not offer it. I'm gonna finish up by talking about some of the other tests that can be done for women with dense breasts. Tomosynthesis is sometimes called 3D mammography, digital breast tomosynthesis, or just TOMO. It received FDA and Health Canada approval in 2011, but it's still not widely available in Canada. It increases cancer detection and it reduces false alarms from screening mammograms. But the task force says there's no evidence to, to support using it. It's used for screening only in some locations in Alberta or through participation in research in Vancouver and at some sites in Ontario and Quebec. 
Now this study of Tomo done in Norway and many others done elsewhere showed a 20% increase in cancer detection and a 50% decrease in false alarms. So this is the holy grail of screening mammography. That's the weaknesses of screening is that it doesn't find all cancers and there's too many false alarms, but this actually fixes both. Tomosynthesis is most helpful in category B and C breasts, and that's because in category A, we're finding most of the cancers just on screening mammography, and in category D, they're hidden because even with Tomo, they're still surrounded on all sides by normal tissue, the snowball and the snowstorm effect, so we can't see them as well. The research question in this Italian study was, if we use Tomo as screening, do we still need to do screening ultrasound? The short answer is yes. They screened over 3,000 women with Tomo and ultrasound, and the ultrasound detected nearly twice as many additional cancers as the Tomo. So doing uh, two, 3D mammography doesn't eliminate the need for supplemental screening in women with dense breasts, but it's still worth doing because it does find more cancers and it reduces the false alarms. MRI has been used for women at high risk for decades. The woman lies face down with her breasts hanging into these slots that you can see with the red arrows, and the table is rolled into the magnet. It has the highest cancer detection rate, between 10 and 16 per thousand in the first round. It uses no ionizing radiation. It's been proven to reduce interval cancers and late stage disease. And the nodes in the armpit are included in the scan field so we can assess them on MRI. But claustrophobia is an issue because it requires that a woman lie still for 45 minutes in the magnet. Now, MRI generally cannot be done in women with pacemakers and other metal implanted devices. It does require an intravenous injection with something called gadolinium, which is known to accumulate in the brain and other body tissues. Now, so far, there are no long-term negative effects of gadolinium. But MRI is very expensive, and access is inadequate in most of Canada. So its use is reserved for women only at very high risk, like the women with MRI muta uh, BRCA uh, mutations. In this uh, trial in the Netherlands, MRI is being offered to women with category D breasts, but no other risk factors, after a negative 2D mammogram in a randomized trial. In the first year, MRI found 16.5 additional cancers per thousand after a negative mammogram. Now remember, mammograms find about five to seven, and this is finding an additional 16.5. Because it was a randomized trial, 40% of the women who were offered the MRI said no thanks. But the women who did have, have MRI had six times fewer interval cancers compared to the control group. And remember, minimizing interval cancers is one of the goals of screening. Researchers in Germany investigated the benefits of MRI screening in all women aged 40 to 70 at average risk including all categories of breast density, not just the dense breasts, and they found an additional 15.5 cancers per thousand. So as a result of these and other studies, the European Society of Breast Imaging issued new guidelines earlier this year. For all women aged 50 to 70 with category D breasts, they now recommend screening breast MRI preferably every two to three years, but at least every four years. They acknowledge that it might also be valuable in for women who have less dense breasts, like category C, but more research is needed. And if MRIs are unavailable, they say that ultrasound in combination with a mammogram may be used as an alternative. So you ask, why not do MRI for everyone? Well, I've told you, it's expensive, and there are not enough MRI machines or trained personnel to run them. Not everyone can have MRI, people with kidney problems, pacemakers or other implants, or those with claustrophobia and it's that IV injection of gadolinium, although, as I said, there's no harmful effects at the time, so we have no hesitation to use MRI for women at very high risk, like the BRCA women. Now, there's a faster way of doing breast MRI called abbreviated MRI, and instead of the conventional scan, which takes about 45 minutes in the scanner, this one's only about 10 minutes, and it would make it less expensive and might make it more tolerable for women claustrophobia, but it still requires the intravenous gadolinium. So who should have screening MRI? Well, this light list is likely to change with additional research, but as of now, the American College of Radiology recommends women with a calculated lifetime risk of greater than 20%, so that includes women with genetic mutations, women who've had chest uh, radiation for lymphoma, 
uh, women who have dense breasts who've had cancer, and all women who've had cancer before age 50, including women with no, non-dense breasts. In Canada, the availability of MRI is much more restrictive. Another test showing uh, success in dense breasts is called molecular breast imaging. It's a nuclear medicine test and uses an injection of radioactive material. It was pioneered at the Mayo Clinic and is not offered anywhere in Canada. The radiation dose to the breast is about four times that of mammography, and unlike the low-dose radiation we get from mammography, uh, this is higher dose, and it's not limited to the breast. The radiation is to the whole body, especially the pelvis, and it finds about seven to eight cancers per thousand. The last test I'll discuss is called contrast-enhanced mammography. It's an up-and-coming test and has been purchased by multiple sites in Canada. It uses upgraded mammography equipment, so there's no need to buy expensive new equipment. It uses the same intravenous that we use for CAT scans, so gadolinium's not a concern. It has a similar cancer detection rate to MRI, but it's faster and cheaper, and it has been proposed as an excellent alternative for women who can't tolerate MRI. Now, breast self-exams are discouraged by the task force, but since no province in Canada is doing optimal screening and by that I mean annual mammograms starting at age 40 for all women, and very few are offering supplemental screening for women with dense breasts, how are we gonna find all those cancers earlier? Women are told that they should be breast aware and see their doctor if they notice a change in their breasts, but how do you know that there's been a change if you don't know what your normal feels like? And every woman's breast texture is unique to her. Everybody's got lumpiness and texture, and even if a family doctor did a breast exam every year, we can't expect them to remember what a woman's breast felt like last time they examined her. But an individual woman who does breast self-exam is gonna be more expert than any healthcare provider, and she's more likely to notice if there's been a change. So I recommend that all women do breast self-exam, especially those having a mammogram only every two years, and women with dense breasts who aren't having supplemental screening. Please do breast self-exam. If you are destined to get breast cancer in the future, please help us find it as early as possible. Now, there are lots of videos on YouTube showing you how to do breast self-exam, but my favorite is by a uh, breast surgeon in the UK who's had breast cancer herself, and her name is Liz O'Reardon. Now, I don't expect you to copy the link, but maybe Jane will send it out to everybody after, or you can just Google on, oh, sorry, not Google, go on YouTube and do breast self-examination, Dr. O'Reardon, you should be able to find it. Now, you might wonder how this Canadian task force came to their danger, dangerous guidelines. You should know that there are international standards on how to make guidelines, but the Canadian task force didn't follow them because they ignored experts, they ignored observational studies, and they didn't have any patients on their panels. They didn't consider the benefits of less aggressive therapy from treatment. They numerically overstated the risks of screening, and they referred to recalls as false alarms, uh, as, sorry, as false positives instead of false alarm. False alarm, false positive means we told you had cancer when you didn't. False alarm is there's something on your test, we need to do a little more testing. They recommended against supplemental screening for women with dense breasts without reviewing the available evidence. And what's really unfortunate is that other organizations, even the Canadian Cancer Society, support the task force without doing their own review. So it creates an echo chamber. These guidelines are leading to unnecessary deaths and late diagnoses, which require aggressive therapy and cause unnecessary suffering. So the take home points for, from this talk are that dense breasts are normal and common, Women in British Columbia are notified of their breast density on their screening mammogram, and women should understand the two risks of dense breasts, the masking and the increased risk. I'm going to stop there, and thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to your questions later.